I'm Desi Fitzgerald, a former car curler, and I now work as a motivational speaker and life coach. Picked up a hurley, uh, mum and dad said at the age of three and loved it from the moment I picked it up um, and really took off yeah, since, uh, since the age of three onwards. Yeah. My dad brought me uh, up in the train to a game. It was Turles we went to first, I'm nearly sure. Um, and it was against Limerick too. It was the first game I, I went to with him. And I, I just remember sitting uh, on the bench and up in the stand and just getting sweets, you know, bonbons, I remember it so clearly. Um, but yeah, what a, the excitement, my God, it was absolutely huge. Uh, just, you know, first time hearing crowds roaring and, uh, and supporting Cork as well. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, huge, so it was. I remember being out the back and uh, beating a ball off a wall and Brian Corcoran was huge at the time and uh, he was on my head. Because I used to play in the back, so I used to be full back or centre back at a, at a young age. I remember always wanting to be like him. And he's, yeah, hitting the ball, I was like, someday I'll play for Cork. I'm the oldest, uh, I'm the oldest of them all, yeah. Connor is next, uh, then Mike and then James. I, I remember the day like it was yesterday, so I do so clearly. I um, I finished work to go to go hurling training, actually. All of us were going myself. Um, Connor and Mike were going uh, training, so I finished work a little bit early, but I was going to see them um, first because they were just back from America. They were only back a few days. And um, look, to cut a long story sharp, I travelled home and uh, on the way home I saw my brother's van parked in a, in a farmyard and uh, it was the entrance to it and I found it a little bit strange that it was parked there so I, um, I walked in the passage and anyway, after walking in I just found that he uh, had taken his own life. Um, yeah, so it was crazy, I just couldn't believe it when I, when I saw it, like someone that um, I'd never seen struggling or suffering in uh, in any way in terms of his his mental health, um, and so initially I just I was in disbelief. Ran out of the, the shed when I saw it, and um, then ran back in and just saw it was him and uh, <sighs> screamed, roared, wanted to vomit, <laughs> went through all sorts of. Um, it was just in shock afterwards, just in uh, disbelief. Um, Mike was twenty three, yeah. <gasps> He had his own carpentry company um, set up as well, he, probably about maybe a year beforehand. And it was flying, he was doing really well, just bought a new van for himself and he had a huge network of friends and they were extremely, extremely close, great bunch of lads. And involved in, in hurling as well, so I would have known them all very well. I remember been one, meeting one guy, Sam Kiley, up in the, the, the field we were training. I was just asking him, I was like, was there anything that he noticed along the way or did you ever see him struggling? And, in any way and he was the exact same like he hadn't seen anything or I was like you know had something happened in town or a night out or anything like that or had he fallen out with anybody but he, he hadn't um, which just leaves this more mind-boggling you know more questions unanswered. He passed away on the 8th of August 2011 and then it was actually the 8th of October 2011, it was exactly two months um, apart that that game was on. Normal day, yeah, the only other thing was it was, was Mike had passed away and wanted to win it for him. But other than that, it was just a normal game. Uh, one, of course, that we wanted to win. Um, about 25 minutes into the game, um, I saw it was a corner forward. He was going to, uh, the ball landed at his feet and um, I sprinted back. I was playing centre back. I sprinted back as quickly as I could to try and just flick the ball away from him. Um, and so I was a little bit behind him, so I dived in for a tackle to flick it away. And um, another player came out as well. So I kind of got sandwiched between two players, but I got knees into the chest from, from one player and my head sprung back and forward. And I was in a daze just for a few seconds. I, I, don't, I can't remember, even remember the impact of it, but um, I came out of the daze after a few seconds and 
to obviously try to move and get myself up, but I was like, I can't move. What's I was like, it was the strangest thing. I was like, what's going on here? I can't feel or move anything. And um, yeah, I was just, from that point on, I couldn't uh, move from below my shoulders down. So everything went silent for me, everything. And I just laid in the grass, I was looking to my right hand side and I just thought to myself, this can't be happening. And Mike came into my head uh, initially. I, and when I realised I couldn't move anything, I was like, I just I remember just asking him for help at that time. I was just like, please help me, um, that can't be happening. And so everything went extremely, extremely quiet until I remember um, until I remember the nurses coming over then. And I uh, just yeah, could hear people once again. The doctor told me that I'd fractured C4, the bone in my neck, and that it also damaged my spinal cord. But he said that my injury was um, an incomplete injury which meant that he didn't know what type of a recovery, if any, I would make, but he was like, there's, there's a chance that you, that that's, uh, something may come back uh, again. So at that time, I was just grateful for that, there being some element of hope, because before that, I was thinking, that's it, you know, I'm going to be um, relying on everyone around me for the rest of my days to do everything for me. Being in hospital and the first movement I got was on my left, my big toe on my left foot. It was bonkers. I remember being and lying in the bed, and because uh, I used to be, I used to have my eyes closed at times, and I used to be trying to get things to move, and obviously nothing happened. But the first time I got my uh, big toe to, to move on the bed, like tears just started uh, coming out my eyes and uh, or coming on my face, and I was like, oh my god, <sighs> like this might be the start of it now. Um, so that was huge. It was absolutely massive. Um, and then on my wedding day, I managed to uh, to walk down the aisle. I'm in a wheelchair, but I managed to walk down the aisle because Luke had put on a huge amount of work in rehab, and I've been supported by so many people in the, the National Rehabilitation Hospital in Dunleary that uh, that was another massive, massive milestone for me. Thankfully, because of all the work I've put in for the last um, going on nine years now, uh, it's, a, it's like a full-time job. But thankfully, I am where I'm at, where I'm at now, and I can. I can, do, I can do a lot now, I can do stuff with my kids and everything, which is something I'm very grateful for. There wasn't that much of a gap between myself and Connor and Mike. James then, like I was uh, 13, going on 14 when he was born. Initially, when I heard it, I was like, I can't believe my mother's pregnant. Like, uh, she kept <laughs> being in school in first year, I was like, going to be embarrassed with a pregnant mum dropping me off to school. But, um, well, yeah, as soon as he was born, my God, that young man was absolutely idolised, so he was. You know, we were able to, I suppose, do much, so much for him. We like we used to be grabbing him off my mum when we come home from school to feed him and, uh, and this, that and the other. So, yeah, extremely, extremely close. He was 16 when he passed away. Um, he'd 16 amazing years whilst he was uh, alive here. He, uh, yeah, just a really happy-go-lucky, lively character. Again, great network of friends, lovely sport. Um, and yeah, as I said, we always we all had a real, uh, always had a real, really close relationship. Um, James went to, to work out in the gym, um, so, and he uh, he was I suppose three quarters way through his workout, and um, he he just he passed away of sudden adult death syndrome whilst he was uh, at the gym. I went into the bathroom with Sarah after it happened and I uh, looked at her and I was like, that's it. <laughs> I'm done now, I, uh, I'm not going to be able to cope with this, with all the, this loss and spinal cord injury, everything, you know, two brothers and spinal cord injury. I said, that's it for me, I'm going to, I don't know what, but I'm not going to be able to survive here in a way. She just said, you know, you will, it'll, it will make this work, you'll make this work. And, uh, yeah, it landed probably somewhere, but couldn't feel it at the time. I was just numb and didn't have that much movement, so I couldn't, you know, expel any feelings I had by moving in any way. So I was just stuck with it all inside. How can all this happen to, to one family? Like, it didn't make any sense. I saw that in the next Inder's Christmas special, I would have said, <laughs> it wouldn't happen. But um, it happened to us and couldn't get my head around it. After a while, I was I was in a dark hole, 
And the only way I knew I was going to get out of it was actually changing how I had done things before and allow myself to be vulnerable, like, and open up to somebody. Um, and to begin with, I started off just by speaking to one person. Um, it was Tom Carey was his name. Um, speaking to him, and he was, he was brilliant. I was getting things off my chest, and he um, suggested a workshop to me. Um, it was a clear mind workshop, and that was a, so it was a group workshop, like I suppose group therapy in a way. And I, uh, it was a weekend workshop. Went in, there was, I think about 17 of us there, possibly participants. And I was like, I'm not going to open up in front of these people, no way. But uh, after the second or third person, I was like, right, I'm just going to go for it. Open up, share about everything that had happened. And I thought I'd be judged in some way. I thought I'd feel like, you know, I'm doing something that's wrong here by sharing and crying like I did. And, uh, but I was met with just such compassion um, at that time. I was like, in a weight that lifted off my shoulders. And then I spent three days at that workshop just literally doing that. And they had various exercises that we were doing to keep on releasing emotions that were holding me back, sadness, anxiety, anger, shame, guilt, everything. It was just like a three-day intensive journey of just really stripping myself back and speaking about what had gone on. And uh, that was, you know, that was definitely a huge turning point for me because when, that had, when I did that and felt the impact of it, I stayed doing it over the last, still do it to this day. I've become someone now that speaks of no problem speaking about my feelings, no problem in being vulnerable with certain people in my life, no problem in opening up. Um, we all need to do it, we all struggle, every one of us. Um, and so instead of holding on to it, it's about letting it out. And so when I saw the impact that it was having on me, um, came out the other side of it, and I was like, I would love to be able to do this for another human being. And um, so I'm at the college to begin with, uh, started a counselling programme with ClearMind and uh, graduated with them as a, as a counsellor and, and then I went on and did a Masters in, in Life Coaching in UCC because I thought they were a perfect mix. I genuinely love it, like, because when you see a human being coming in my door and struggling in some shape or form, but then after a while leaving and being different and them getting a weight off their chest, like that's... Oh, yeah, that's uh, there's a huge feeling of gratitude I get um, for that. So it's something that I absolutely love because I questioned, you know, what what was all this for? Like, like how? What's the reason for all of this happening? And so, as I said, I would have become quite spiritual over the last while. And so, maybe that's it. Like, maybe all of this was thrown my way so that I can be somebody different, and maybe so that I can support other people when they're struggling in their lives. Um, and so if it is, I'm going to roll with that. Like, it's to keep on growing and evolving as a, just as a man and to try and do that for me and also try and do it for other people as well. Like, people, we all have different energies about us, right? And so if I'm doing that for me, someone will pick it up in some shape or form. And so then I might be able to help somebody else um, along the way. So, yeah, a goal for me, just be the best person I can be, father, son, husband, everything and uh, yeah, make the most out of life. I've learned the hard way that life is, life is short. Like, like who knows what's going to happen in any given moment. So whilst we're here, we better make the absolute most out of it.